welcome everyone to webinar number four. We're super excited to have you there. Say hi, Paul. Hello. Perfect. So, team, we are, uh, let's just go quickly through some of the stuff that we already have to go through. So, team, this is our last webinar series, and we are happy that we're ending, but also we're pretty sad that we're not going to get to see you in the next couple of Tuesdays to talk and hang out. Uh, but as you, we'll do a quick review, we went through the introduction of momentum and structure, the two dominant traditions. And our main argument, as we said in the first webinar, was that if we integrate momentum and structure, then uh, a lot of change could happen. It's the, it's, the, it's the moment where revolution happens where really we can engage masses of people. Then we said, okay, well, if integration is the way to go, what is our theory of our understanding of how integration is done? And then we talked a lot about this three elements of the theory, the active popular support, the escalation, the absorption, right? Last week, we went through the best practices of the model, uh, the best practices in the hybrid model. We talked about a lot, odd for other open source movements. We talked about the DNA, the elements, what does it look like. I know some people have their mind blown. It was pretty cool. And today, we're going to be making something quite simple, which is what are the most common problems? So if when once you already say, I want to do the integration, I want to do parts of the model, or I want to do the whole model that we're presenting here, you can make your own model as well. What are the common problems that we're going to face? And that's what we're going to talk to you today. So let's get started. So first, uh, what I wanted to share is that really the game of understanding the common problems is, is an understanding of anticipation. Now, I don't know how many of you have played a video game against the five-year-old. So I know most of the times when I played against the five-year-old, uh, I see the five-year-old playing, and they're playing for like 10, 20 minutes. They're playing, playing, playing. And then I get the control, and I do, you know, bing, 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 bing. I'm start shooting, and then a minute, two minutes later, I lose, and I die. And I'm like, okay, cool. So then I get the control again to the five-year-old. The five-year-old starts playing, and 35 minutes happens later, and I get the control back, and I'm thinking I'm the biggest idiot. Now I get really intense, right, because it's a five-year-old. I'm supposed to be much older. He's not supposed to know more than I do. So then I go ahead, I start playing, and I do beep, 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 and now I lost in under 30 seconds. I give the control back to the little kid, and now he has two hours left. I get the control back. I don't even want to play. Now the question becomes, why the heck does the kid know so much about this game, right? I mean, I'm supposed to be older, wiser, understand more about life. He's just five. How that? Does he know this stuff more? And the reality is he does more is because he played the game before. So he was able to anticipate every problem at every level that already happens. He was able to foresee what could be the complications. And that's literally what this session will be about today. So Paul, let's get us started in this part of when something goes wrong. So I'm really happy that we get to present this to you because in some ways uh, this is very different from the structure tradition I came from where um, I really depended on the top-level leadership of the union and the community organizations whenever I got in trouble. You know, I, I, all these problems would emerge and people would get scared and I didn't know what to do. Or if there was a lot of complex problems. We were sued or there were problems with uh, anti-union campaigns. And I really needed the top-level leaders. And the leaders really trained me through apprenticeship so that um, – they really could direct what I was doing, and I didn't really need to know all everything at the beginning because I could rely on their experience. They knew all the problems from their 20 years of experience of what organizers ex experience, and, and it didn't really make sense for them to like do all this training in the beginning because it would just be too much for me. But when we're talking about momentum, we're talking about the hybrid, and we're talking about the what we these decentralized organizational models. We're talking a different model. There isn't a leader that these 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 all these decentralized teams or these these people who are in these leadership roles. There's no place for them to go to to ask a leader if they're in problems, if they have problems. So they have to really depend on the organization to prepare them, to give them a crash course in all the major problems, and to, to, to give them sort of a, a guide 
that allows them to predict those problems, which we call uh, vaccination, inoculation, anticipation, are all words that decentralized organizational structures use so that every leader can survive uh, the problems that are most likely to come out without depending on leadership. Perfect. So in this model, uh, when I was in the global justice movement and the labor movement and the immigrant rights movement, uh, I read a lot of history and I realized, holy crap, so many of the problems that happened in this movement happened in the civil rights movement. It happened with Gandhi. Uh, so what we're going to try to do here is really give you what we think are the repetitive problems that happen in almost all movements. But what we've realized is one way to really understand these problems is they come from two different cognitive frames. One is what we call prefigurative, and one is what we call control. Those are the two major groups of categories of the problems that the movement is going to experience. And uh, I want to explain something. Prefigurative theories of change is different than momentum and is different than structure. This is a theory of change that believes in living the revolution, in being the change, in forming counterculture, uh, while strategic change uh, that most social movements are very engaged in is about trying to change the dominant institution, trying to change the government, trying to change corporations that dominated our lives. In the labor movement, trying to change the corporation that affects the workers, not creating a new corporation, uh, making the change. And these are conflicting theories of change. Now they can be integrated, but we're not going to go into that. What, what I can tell you from experience is that um, whether or not you agree or disagree with prefigurative politics to me doesn't matter. That Those conflicting theories of change uh, are reoccurring in almost every movement and is one of the major source of conflicts throughout my experience again and again and again is people who have a prefigurative viewpoint on how the world should change. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. So um, that way of thinking, of saying, I don't really care as much about creating the revolution so every, you know, all the institutions in the government is the revolution. I want to just create my own counterculture. I want to live the revolution. Well, what does that do? It, it does create a lot of people who think like that um, are, good, are people who are good at creating strong countercultures. They, a lot of times they can create countercultures that are very good uh, at using language, you, uh, getting deep commitments, uh, getting people to make deep sacrifice and take leadership in those countercultures over a long period of time because they want to participate in the counterculture. They're really good about thinking about, okay, if we're going to build this revolution, we're going to create a commune or we're going to create a counter institution, how do we meet people's individual needs? They're also very good at preserving countercultural values or subcultural values, beliefs in the face of dominant culture. And you, you can see this within um, subcultures like uh, a punk music scene or uh, grunge music or within religious movements like the Catholic workers or the Amish. You can, you can see this within uh, anarchist uh, sub countercultures. You know, there's many different ways this is expressed, but all of them have uh, some of those same strengths. But those types of theories of change, which uh, are able to provide certain things, are also have big weaknesses. And specifically, they have weaknesses if we look at it in our model. Because we already went over in the webinar, too, our theory of change, which we're going right. to look over again. And that's the major conflict, is that prefigurative problems come when these people enforce their theory of change that doesn't fit into our theory of change, which is winning active public support, which is how all social movements in the United States of America has won major changes is through this basic theory of change of winning active popular support. 
And Erica Chenoweth said in her monumental studies of movements that um, all the movements across the globe, 300 movements, she said the quintessential uh, uh, similarity of victory is sustained active support of 3.5% of the population. Pretty cool. So weaknesses of this movement is that it alienates the public that you need, not just a 3.5%, but you also need a bigger group to support you, a, a critical mass of, uh, of people to passively support you too. And you use language, symbols, beliefs, and tactics that can be alienating. You, you also, a lot of times, those, those cultures are very ideological, which isn't bad necessarily to maintain a counterculture, but when you're I, very ideological, and you're, you're really outside the mainstream, it's very hard for people to feel comfortable to join you. The, a lot of these countercultures are very critical of structure and decision-making processes of organizations other than their own. So the Amish have a very decentralized democratic way in which they make decisions, and anything that's outside of that they believe is from the devil. You know? So, I mean, I might be exaggerating a little bit, but it's true that they really have a purity of how they believe all their institutions should function, and the same way in a lot of anarchist subcultures. They're very critical of anything that's not consensus. And that makes it very hard for organizations that don't have those processes to be part of the movement. And they're paranoid of co-optation. Well, if you're a punk in a punk music scene, when, when Green Day becomes mainstream, you know, you, your counterculture has a hard time surviving because it's no longer a counterculture. But for us, we want a certain level of co-optation. We want to become the mainstream. We want to change. We want our beliefs to be accepted by a majority of people. So there's a real conflict between counterculture that is super scared and will lose its identity by getting a critical mass of public support, by being adopted and supported by, by all the institutions. And us, who that's the actual goal, is for us to actually make changes to the dominant institutions. And then, thank you, Paul. And then the other side of the coin is what we call control problems. And all of these ones mostly manifest on the structure. So when large institutions want to do momentum, this is actually most of the problems that they suffer with are control problems. So the first one that I want to mention about is that they get afraid of escalation in any form. And this happens because most, most of the times the organizations or the structural organizations, they believe that they have to take care of their membership or the people that they represent. So when you're having mass arrests of 500, 1,000, 2,000 people, you start thinking, well, do we have enough money to get people out of jail? Do we have any, enough bond money? You know? Uh, well, what if we get into a bad relationship with the police? What if this affects our, some of our legal liabilities that we get too exposed with all this escalation, right? And because they're mostly thinking, sometimes they're not thinking about active popular support, right? They're thinking that it's between the fight between them and the target. You know, even when they do escalation. So they're not thinking how to engage masses and how can the masses join or form alternative institutions for doing more escalation, right? Another one is that then uh, they also can really defend narrow organizational issues as sort of popular issues. I'm going to talk more about that and an example specifically with the DREAM Act. But this mainly has to do that you're pushing for something larger, right? Like a symbolic popular demand. And then people get bogged down with saying like some very specific policy details. That you're like, nobody even understands that, but that's what sometimes the organizational interest plays into. The third one is the control of actions, because it feels like all these people are going to join in. It's so big, the organization gets freaked out and said, oh my god, how am I going to control all these people? Especially if I'm asking all these new people to come in and do escalation, how can I control their behavior if I don't know them? I need to know them, I need to build a relationship, but by the time you do all the stuff, you lost your time of escalation. The two other parts that I would say is, one, there is a lot of vulnerability to selling out. Either one, because some politician tells you, dude, do not escalate, and you'll get some support from us on this, and they don't escalate, right? Or losing power. Some people feel like they're going to attack, their organization is going to lose. The only relationships that they already have, they don't want to risk their relationships, which a lot of people in a lot of movements can complain about, right? That people don't want to polarize and escalate because they're going to lose the people that already support them in many ways. And the last one is that I would say that sometimes within the structure, people do not understand the value that the movement would produce. So for example, how would it bring new resources, either money or leaders? How would it produce new leaders? And this happens a lot because of not understanding the concepts of absorption, not really understanding what is produced after escalation. So those are what we call control problems. Now we want to go back to our beautiful cycle of momentum. 
because we think the cycle here is pretty cool, right? We'll get the small actions, the moments of the whirlwind. Here, once you do the nonviolent action for a popular demand, once you do that, you absorb as much as you can. You absorb even more. That's why this thing keeps turning around. <laughs> and then hopefully you put people in voluntary simplicity or you create organizing teams that can create stronger movement organizations so then you can do the cycle again. Now, I want to go over what the cycle is about. And I want to go over it because the cycle is not really simple. And if it would be simple, right, Paul, everybody would do it. So first it starts when a strong organization chooses to risk escalation. That's where it starts, right? A strong movement organization, we got to have first, then it risks to escalate. Second, then you do a world plan escalation. Creates a trigger event and maybe sometimes a moment of the whirlwind. If that happens, if you did the escalation well, which is this third point here, right? Right. If you design it in a way that was looking for a popular issue that activated popular support, then it generates good polarization, which then creates popular support. But then after that, you have to absorb that. If you do not have a strong movement organization, it's going to be hard to absorb. But the whole point is to absorb so the organization can become stronger. Now, this is the last part of the deal. Once you absorb, you cannot just keep all the people because all the people that you absorb, they want to escalate more. So now you got to proceed to do greater amounts of escalation. So if you got 500 people arrested and you absorb all these people, now you got to do 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 and so forth and so forth. Now, again, I would say if this would be easy, a lot of people would do it. But it's not that easy, right? And I would love Paul to talk a little bit about this because we can see here that Every, we have to do the three things very well for the cycle to move around in circles so that it creates the spiral or the moment of the whirlwind that we're talking about. Well, so in each phase of that cycle of momentum, there is a lot of problems that stop us from doing that. So when we have a strong organization, there are a lot of things that stop us from escalating. And we're going to talk about that later within the two barrels, within the prefigurative and the control problems. But Basically, there's, it's very hard for an organization to make that decision and actually follow through with escalating. And even after they escalate and they do a nonviolent actual popular demand, it's very hard for them to have the right theory of change and have created the action with active popular support. With all the things that we, we talked about there, there's a lot of things that go wrong there so that it doesn't create popular support. The action did, wasn't, it lost a lot of the things that it needed to be able to grip the public or bring the public in. And then after that, there's a lot of problems with absorption. The, the structures aren't designed and whatever. And we're going to go over in detail what are the most common problems in each of those stages, each of those arrows um, of the cycle. Ooh. Prefigurative problems. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we should totally stop for questions. So, team, we just went through, we'll go back to this. We just went through the first part, which is this two types of problems. We put them under the cycle of momentum. Now we're going to talk about uh, how those problems manifest in absorption, escalation, and active popular support. But we'd love to hear what you're thinking. What is being useful and what's confusing? Just to see some thoughts. I need feedback, people. Please give me feedback. What was helpful about what I said? What was unclear? Uh, um, Zane, Zane has joined the call or, or the session. Hi, Zane. He was having computer problems. Give me some feedback, people. Any experiences this is relating to you? Yeah. So, how are there? So, what we're looking for right now is what it, what has been useful and what Paul and Carlos just said, and what is unclear. And then, um, if nothing's coming up for you there, um, if you're just reminded of a time when you've seen people sort of start the cycle of momentum, and then, you know, notice that there was an absorption problem or an escalation problem or a problem with active popular support. Leland says that he liked the framework for thinking about limited cultural change versus widespread 
transformational change. I think we should continue. It sounds to me like they're saying, give us more. Okay. So let's rock and roll. Okay. So Paul, run us to prefigure the problems. So these are the problems that we see happen when people have a different theory of change than the one we just went over. And people who have prefigurative theories of change create all these problems that we're going to talk through in each of the stage of the cycles. And the first one we're going to talk about is uh, one around active popular support. When we call this the meta-narrative problem, but basically people who don't believe in creating meta-narratives that, that allow you to be in dialogue with the public uh, create narratives that isolate the public. Uh, this is a, a picture of the Fuck the Police rally in uh, Occupy Oakland. This was a weekly event for a couple of months in Oakland. Uh, and I think if, if you do polling about the police, um, you know, the, the population generally, a huge portion of the population has respect for the police, even if they have their own criticism. But uh, I, I think it's, it, it isolates a hell of a lot of people, even if they, they have some complaints about the police, to frame your whole message as fuck the police. Okay, So that is not a good meta narrative uh, uh, that's going to help you get popular support. And I don't think these people are really concerned. They, they want to express their anger, and they have a belief that expressing their anger uh, is, is justified, and, and it probably is. But uh, we're, we're thinking about this in what we need to do to create a meta-narrative for the public. Another one, another popular support problem that happens in prefigurative is another meta-narrative problem. So for example, in uh, there was Proposition 187 that happened in California many, many years ago, I think about 20 years ago. And there was this huge rallies. There was kind of a moment of the war when there was a lot of trigger events, a lot of people marching in California because it was a law that would have taken public benefits rights from undocumented people. And what happened is that people displayed a lot of Mexican flags and actually they lost this. They actually preposition 27 won. And I know in the immigrant rights movement where I come from, there's a lot of debate about this. But I think what happens is that it's hard to engage the American public when we have flags from all of our other other countries because it sends a different message. And actually what I love to say here is that even if you read what it says here, it says no racism uh, illiteracy, no, I mean, it makes the message makes no sense, you know, compared to, for example, what happened later in 2006, where the movement had some of the, some flags from other countries, but then the movement changed and did American flags and was highly successful in speaking to a majority of the public. Again, I want to live in a country that is super diverse, and, and I'm not even from here, you know, <laughs> but uh, I think we have to be really clear about what we're speaking to people about. And what is the story that we're trying to convey on the movement? And how does that not become, you know, well, screw you, America. Well, this is just about Mexicans. This is even alienating everybody else who's not Mexican. You know, I'm Peruvian, and am I not part of this? That's where position 187 doesn't affect me. Or other countries like Salvador or other. So sometimes that's part of the cult mentality sometimes. So another thing with conflicting theories of change is people that want, uh, that believe in that the action in itself is the means and the ends together, right? So they feel like it's a temporary autonomous zone. Uh, it, the whole point of the revolution is to do it right now, okay? Like people in Occupy, there, there was a lot of people who had a theory of change that the goal was to create the alternative in the park. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to be totally in, in conflict, but a lot of times it becomes in conflict because people think that the prefigurative way uh, is the is uh, more prioritized than everything else, and what we feel is that the it has to fit within the theory of change of gaining active public support. So if you can have a great drum circle, that's fine. That's a you know that could be okay. But is it moving? Uh, is it giving you active public support when you're doing it in the middle of the night and you're pissing everybody else off? Okay. So it's the same thing like with communes in the 60s, like. A lot of people say, we, we're going to end the war by everybody dropping out and joining communes. Well, a lot of people don't care if, if hippies join a commune or if a certain part of the population, they would like that to happen. 
I'm not saying that people living in communes, I live in an intentional community. I think that's wonderful that that provides certain things and a, a model of how to live in an alternative, and it provides people who are willing to make sacrifices for strategic movements. But those are conflicting theories of change when people don't understand that li me living in an intentional community is really about providing support for strategic change when it comes to building a popular movement. Thank you. And Paul, can you even imagine the amount of conversations that the movement has just because they have a conflicting theory of change? Because if you're understanding of how you're going to change things, it's very different among groups. Imagine how you can even agree on actions. It's just impossible. You just talk about it all the time. So another thing, and I'll say this, uh, I've had many experiences in my life of losing nonviolent discipline. Okay, I was in Quebec City during the anti-globalization movement, or I'd rather call it the global justice movement against the FTAA, and I was there. I saw people throw mocktail cocktails at the cops um, within uh, a zone that was supposed to be nonviolent, and we lost a lot of public support in the United States and in Canada and all over the world because people have a hard time sympathizing with violence. And it's very clear that uh, that, that is the effect it has on the movement. Uh, we saw that almost instantly when uh, we had a huge um, coalition of churches, of unions, and once they felt there was people throwing mocktail cocktails, a lot of them pulled out. A lot of them did not want to participate in the movement and was afraid of the movement. I mean, if we're going to create a movement where my grandma can show up, kids can show up, they, they, we can do militant nonviolence because there's a choice of being involved in it, but we can't have violence and property destruction. That really isolates us from uh, a huge portion of the American population. Perfect. Um, and I just want to say this. Um, this has been a... a Keeping nonviolent discipline is something that is probably the biggest problem of all nonviolent movements. Gandhi said it was the, the greatest challenge within his experience of nonviolence. Many leaders have said it is the biggest challenge. Almost every single social movement that I have read about struggles with nonviolent discipline. Gandhi's biography, he had something called the Himalayan miscalculation. After he was famous in South Africa, he went to India, he started a movement, and he lost control of it. And once that happens, we know this because movements are decentralized, that once the culture becomes violent, it's very hard then to create that nonviolent culture again, unless it's front-loaded and into the DNA and protected from the beginning. So what Gandhi did is he had to stop the whole movement, and he fasted till death against his own people. Uh, and this was... It was an incredible, uh, challenging thing to do, and it was very hard on the movement to stop everything and, and the organizations and the momentum dying and, and a lot of the organizations falling apart and him actually fasting until death. But he had to do that to start all anew with a, with a pure culture because once it gets violence, it's very hard to undo that. Yes. And I will add Cesar Chavez to this, which the same thing happens, right? They're doing a lot of organizing, they're doing the boycott, and then people turn, there's some violence. Cesar has to do the same thing that Gandhi did, fast for a certain period of time to get his people recommitted to nonviolence. I mean, I think there's one point I think that is big here is that imagine this team. You go work your butt off for a year, try to build a movement, you launch it, you spend a whole year in the struggle, and in the second year, a couple of people start doing violence, and your movement starts getting the disease of violence throughout, right? And think about this. Gandhi has to fast. Cesar has to fast to literally stop what they've been working for two years about. This is how important nonviolent discipline is. And not also just in the midst of the moment, but how do you do it from the beginning, you know? And I think it's, it's so much work to try to stop your movement and then go back again to it. But it is so real, you know? I want to say this too. Diversity of tactics is anything goes. Okay. Very few people say there's a diversity of tactics and you can't throw bombs and you can't throw mocktail cocktails. <laughs> diversity of tactics means diversity for anything. So anybody can do whatever they want. That and, and even when there's there's a lot of restrictions put on it, like I have been in many actions where there were zones, I've never seen zones work. 
And what I mean by zones is they say, okay, at the same day, in the same action, we're going to have over here nonviolence and over here property structure or violence. That has never worked, partly because the only reason people can do violence and do throw rocks and punch cops is because they have a place to hide. They need to be able to hide in a nonviolent crowd so that the cops can't distinguish them from other people. If everybody's throwing punches at cops, then they'll just arrest everybody and, and, and give them charges of assault and stuff. So those zones, and also it doesn't work with the public because the public perceives the movement as one phenomenon. They don't they just think the movement went violent. They don't. They can't make yeah. the distinguish between the, this person and that person. And so, really, you need to be able to have a brand that uh, that has nonviolence within it. And if people are going to do their, uh, they're they're going to have a prefigurative philosophy. People believe that they have the right, a libertarian, individualistic perspective. There's a lot of different spectacle of the deed. There's a lot of different uh, theories out there. I'm not going to crap on people's necessary theory of change, but it doesn't fit within this model of how to do popular social movements. Right. Um, and if you do that, you, it might make you feel good in that your society allows for the diversity of people to do whatever they want, but it certainly does not win our movement. Once that happens, we're going to polarize absolutely in the wrong way. And also people won't participate, which is what you're saying, right? Because if grandma wants to go to the May 1st mobilization, but she knows that in May 1st we're going to be burning a bunch of stores. She's not going to want to join in. People with children are not going to want to join, which doesn't allow you to increase or engage the masses that we're talking about. So nonviolent discipline, I know we talk a lot about this, but it's super duper, uber important. Uh, now let's talk about control problems. Uh, one of the control problems that I want to talk to you about, team, and the active popular support is this constant insistent on instrumental demands. So for example, uh, there is always in the dream movement a lot of fights for, in, in local fights, so we can get the same rates as other students. So in-state tuition rates that other students get because we get, undocumented students mainly get international rates. So a, a lot of campaigns have done this in-state tuition campaigns, and as you can see here in the Vanity State situation now, now most of the people across the country do not know what in-state tuition now means because it's not very well, it's not a popular issue. State tuition is not a popular issue across the country. So I have suggested to many teams that we should call it, for example, the New Jersey Dream Act, the Massachusetts Dream Act, the Florida Dream Act, all those sort of things. Why? Because the Dream Act already polls well. The Dream Act is something that is known. It's a popular demand. But most of the pushback that I've seen other people, even myself, receive when there's recommendations is like, no. We need to be clear with the legislature what we want. So that notice here is that sometimes we focus and say, well, it's, it's either the policy or it's either the target. The target needs to know what we want from them. So it's the theory of change becomes differently, you know, because they don't really understand that you have to go for active popular support. I will say also, like, when you're working in a community coalition, there's a lot of, like, unions who want to fight for different contract demands or specific things that benefit their members. And it's really hard when you're building a popular movement because everyone has these little demands that are about their members or about something like li living wage for hotel workers, which I think is a great thing, you know, and uh, I think it's wonderful. But a lot of times when you're in coalition or when you're building a movement like we're talking about using our model, it's, that is in conflict with a general uh, movement philosophy that we need to do, which is everyone put aside their instrumental demands to go for more popular ones that reach everyone, that, that power. everyone relates to symbolically, um, which we talked about a little bit in the past around symbolic versus instrumental demands. Thank you, Paul. So I, I want to talk a little bit about fear of escalation. Um, now, there, there's a lot of ways to talk about the fear of escalation. Uh, in a lot of people that have fear of control and they, they have structured organizations in the movement, like labor unions, it's a really, they, they're holding a lot of resources. They're, they're representing a lot of workers and the health benefits of the workers are really on their backs. If they lose the contract, people lose money, they lose their jobs, they lose their health All benefits for stuff, their kids. Yeah. So it's, when, they, when they escalate, it's really scary for them because they're putting a lot on the line. And they're really scared that their members are going to get hurt. They're, they're afraid they're going to lose their relationships with politicians and, and their contracts and 
a lot of the clout that they already have. And they might not have much power, but they have enough to at least provide something for themselves and their members, okay? So when they escalate, everything gets jumbled up. It's very risky. And, and sometimes you don't know if you're going to get a trigger event or a moment of the whirlwind. So in hindsight, it's, it's a lot easier to see. But when people, when people from a structured perspective uh, have a real hard time believing in escalating because of the fear that it's going to create problems. And one of the problems it creates is that when you do that, it polarizes the opposition. You, you're hitting the opposition like a hornet's nest. You're sort of hitting the hornet's nest. Now, in popular movements in civil resistance theory, as we talked about in webinar two, the polarization, we know we're going to polarize the opposition against us. In the civil rights movement, after their, in 1960, after the student sit-ins, there was a tremendous backlash of racist white Southern anger that ended up taking white citizen councils took over the state governments in a lot of these Southern states. And they became more powerful than they ever were on the local level. And the, the Ku Klux Klan had a revival in the South around the civil rights movement. That doesn't mean that the movement wasn't incredibly successful, but it was hard for them to imagine that uh, if they escalated, the opposition was going to become more powerful. They had to have faith that they were going to become more powerful and that actually those people were becoming isolated. The Ku Klux Klan and the white Southern racists were becoming isolated from the rest of the public, which really supported the civil rights movement. And that happened the same thing in the immigrant rights movement, right? 2006 happened, massive mobilization. And this is the thing, when you polarize, you don't only polarize people to support you, but you polarize people against you, as Paul was mentioning in the civil rights movement. So the Minutemen emerges in 2007, they go to the border, anti-immigrant organizations get stronger in 2007, right? And many people were saying, why the heck did we come out in 2006? It would have been much easier, it would have been quiet because we didn't get all this backlash. Now the anti-immigrants are really weak, again, uh, not as, they, as not as they were in 2007. But again, this is a fear of escalation. If we escalate, will we get more repression? And it's a real, it's a real, real, real concern. The other one that I want to share with everybody about is an absorption problem with control, and both in the lack of understanding and capacity. So I talk to a lot of small organizations all the time, and when I talk to them and when I talk to them about absorption, I said to them, "Okay, let's close our eyes. Let's close our eyes for a second, and let's imagine." that there is, you know, 20 people right now outside of your door that they found out that you do great work and they want to join your organization, right? Open your eyes now. Do you think that you can welcome them in your organization and they can have work to do? And they said to me, well, I don't know if they can have work to do, but we can schedule 20 one-on-ones with them throughout this week and join them you know, between two or three of us. Okay, well, that's pretty good. That's a pretty cool response, right? Then I say, close your eyes again. What if you had 2,000 people outside right now? And they're excited. They're forming a whole line outside of you. And they want to join you. They want to come in. They want to rock and roll with your organization. Can you do it? They say, no, Carlos. We don't know what to do with that. So to, that's the other part within the structure or the control dynamic. It's like, what do we do with all these people? When they come in, how do we absorb them? So first, there's a lack of understanding of the actual absorption. And second, there's a lack of capacity. Because to absorb them in that moment, you need to have a training curriculum, right? You need to have the right session. People know what to give. Your organizational structure needs to be able to receive people. It is so key, but it's a constant problem of control. Now, what also could happen with this, which is part of our list right here in the absorption part of structure? is that there is a fear to lose organizational control. But because if your organization already originally has 100 people, members, and you bring 200 new, the equation of power changes because we don't know these people. What if these people get self-organized? What if they overthrow the, the, the leader of the organization? There's all these concerns around the organization. And again, team, oh, go ahead, Paul. Go ahead. Well, I, I just want to say this was very hard because in 2006, we had 1.2 million people march in Los Angeles. And I would have these meetings where we were trying to keep the movement to, together and to try to get the, the movement to escalate to keep the momentum. And there were a lot of very prominent immigrant rights and labor leaders that were like, why do we want to keep it going? It's a flash in the pan. It didn't give us anything. We don't have any leader. We don't have more leaders 
We don't have, we don't have more resources. We don't. Our, our, the union didn't gain any members. Who cares about a flash in the pan? But what they did not measure is that there was anywhere from a 15 to a 30 percent increase in voter turnout. Okay. Not only that, but around a half to a uh, uh, to two. Um, no, a half to about a quarter of all Republican Latinos fled the party. And if you were to calculate how much GOTV, earned media, advertising, canvassing, canvassing that it would take to make that monumental shift, which historically is unprecedented in the American history. There's only a few times in the whole American history where there was that much of a dramatic voting shift. It would be impossible to create that with just restructured resources in a GOTV campaign. You can't do that from just knocking on doors. There was literally a historic shift that could only be created through a, a, a moment of the whirlwind. And but they they don't think that way. They they think about as we said before, sticking their finger and trying to 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 understand the weather and then work within it. They don't believe that somebody can actually change the weather even if they have evidence of the of, of the fact that that did happen. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So Tim, this is just a list of review of the problems. We want to do a quick stop because now we're going to go into the next session which is well how do we anticipate and prevent some of these problems from happening in the first place. But we want to ask you have you experienced this problem before? Have you seen any of this ones happen and, and what is also clear from what Paul and I are sharing and what is also maybe unclear. So Belinda, let's bring Belinda back magically into the webinar. Hello. There hey. she is. So we had a few questions. Oh, so magic. Uh, so we had a few questions come in um, from Ty during the session and then I want to also welcome other people to, to ask questions. Um, he totally, you know, identified with the piece on absorption and said that his local team is trying to figure out how to engage new people and have tasks for volunteers because they're used to doing it all themselves. And then um, his second two questions were about, um, you know, like how do you how do you balance having like a general symbolic demand, but then when it comes to actually negotiating or making a policy policy decision, like actually getting a specific demand um, done. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I can talk about that one. So, for example, for us, when we polarize. So a lot of people talk about all the polarization that happened in the dream movement, right? And there was a lot of escalating actions. There was a lot of protests. There was a lot of media work for years to shift public opinion so that the American public and Latinos will support dreamers. Actually, I think I forget the numbers, but I think at least if you go half of the Latino households, which is more than 50 to 60 million across America, and you ask them about the dreamers, they will tell you that they saw us in TV a couple of times. They, they know who we are. So... I think this is where a structure and momentum go together. So really what allow us to negotiate is that the White House recognized that United We Dream was the main organization they needed to negotiate for to capitalize on the public support. I don't know if this makes sense. So I think it's important, at least from my experience, from what I saw, to have those two running at the same time. How do you have momentum and how do you have enough structure to negotiate? Literally the same document that we gave the White House with the memo of how the threat action should be is the same thing that they actually did, actually kind of word by word. Just because there was so much momentum and the elections was kind of mobilized popular support that made our public support popular or active and that's how they got threatened and that's how they did the threat action. I'll just say this in really uh, quick summary. When you have instrumental demands in this case, Legislative Dream Act, yep, yep. Um, in the lame duck session, um, that if you would have seen all the stuff, the amazing amounts of actions and things they did around winning, trying to win that legislation, it was probably a very good symbolic issue to fight around. Yep. But the problem was is that people didn't understand that the reason they were fighting for it wasn't just to win it because they probably weren't going to win it. They, they just didn't have the support they needed. But it was to win the movement. It was to win the public. So a lot. what makes it different between symbolic and instrumental demands is really that the priority is in our theory of change, which is creating active public support first, first and foremost. And then you negotiate. And then winning the yeah. instrumental stuff, you want to minimize that 
because in the end, you're going to win when you have the active public support at the level you need. And this is the part that people get confused a lot because my question that I would take to a lot of people is why would you negotiate when you have no support? Why would you go and try to get some instrumental demands if you don't have popular support, if you don't have public opinion on your side? So it's the same dynamic. Uh, just, Bell, any other questions? If not, we should proceed. Yeah, um, another kind of question that Ty had nested in there was that, um, like, if, like, what do you do if someone is kind of making fun of you or something if your symbolic demand doesn't seem substantial enough? Mm. So they make it seem like like you don't you don't have real demands or something like that. We're going to go a lot over that in the four lines of defense, cool. but I think one of the problems is is our membership is not on the same page around the theory of change. Once there are, and we've said this time and time again in the webinars, 80% of all the conflicts fall to the side. And I've seen this even when you talk to like the Serbian revolutionaries and you talk to a lot of leaders and you realize that there, they, 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 there's a lot of diversity in personality and politics, but they're, strategically they're very on the same page because they have the same theory of change. It, they're diversity in so many other things, but they understand what it is to win. When your mu movement has that clarity, then it then you could then you can have a constructive logical argument to say, is that going to actually get us active popular support, or is that not? And that's the real argument to have. Everything has to be correlated to how you win, which is getting a critical mass of active public support to participate in in the ways we talked about non-cooperation voting uh, donating and protesting and doing that over and over and over again yes so we're gonna proceed because I want to make sure we get 15 to 20 yes. minutes to finish this last section and then open it up for questions so now we're gonna talk about team uh, so we, t we, we bring up again the five-year-old uh, video game player because that's the mentality we're trying to operate is how do we go at least metaphorically through all the levels of all the problems that we're going to have in our movement so that we can produce some solutions from it before so when we join the game we don't lose that quickly so Paul's going to talk about how do we defend our DNA of our movement so I, I, I like to uh, give you a metaphor which is when they first were creating vaccines back in the old days when there was a smallpox epidemic that was killing everybody. What they realized is that you can give people a certain strand of smallpox that was just a little bit of disease, and that would prepare the body so that it was, it was ready to defend itself against a real attack of smallpox. And they actually injected you with a little bit of that disease. It prepared you. And in, in labor organizing, this is we call this inoculation, which is we know that workers are going to be attacked by their employer once they start organizing a union. So we have to vaccinate them. We have to inoculate them and tell them and be very transparent and actually prepare them for the coming oppression within the movement. And we have to do that with defending against the problems. We have to make sure that all of the the lessons that we have as leaders in all the things, and I really wish somebody had told me this, had really broken it down for me. There is a lot of literature that we're going to do in the reading, what you get to read, that we're not the ones who just came up with this stuff. There's a lot of people that analyze this that are academics. But I wish somebody had broken those things down because every time I experienced a lot of these problems, I felt helpless as a student activist. I felt powerless. But what we're saying is, you need, just like when we said, you need to front load all these things in a decentralized organizational structure so that the organization can survive. You need to front load what we call the traditions or the principles that specifically address how you're going to deal with the most common problems. And the, the biggest one, which we're going to use as an example, is nonviolent discipline. But you need that around a variety of problems, that all those common problems that we were talking about earlier. So that needs to be front-loaded into your DNA, and it needs to be talked about a lot. Just like when in, in Occupy, every General Assembly had a statement of principles about what the meta-narrative, what the story of Occupy, what was it about. 
and that it used consensus or modified consensus. The same thing we have to do. Every we need to have nonviolent principles and think that as part of our meetings, our our big meetings. Part in, in the second thing is that we need it to be part of our mass training. Yes. Those principles and traditions need to be embedded into a mass training that allows everyone to enforce those rules. And a lot of times when people get those trainings, when they get the, the traditions or the principles, they don't really understand how nonviolent discipline is that applicable because at the beginning people aren't thinking about po throwing punches at cops or breaking windows. But when things start heating up, then it becomes an issue. When people start breaking windows, then it becomes an issue, and you need it from the get-go so that they have it already ingrained and they have agreed from the beginning what the basic DNA is. And they get to vote with their feet whether or not they believe in the DNA or not. But once they agree to it, they need a mass training that prepares them to understand the importance of those traditions and principles and gives them the power to enforce it. And when I met uh, the Serbian revolutionaries from Ofpor, uh, we were talking about nonviolent discipline, and I said, in the United States of America, it seems like all these movements that I'm part of, we lose nonviolent discipline, and there's small groups that throw, you know, rocks at windows, and we can't keep the discipline, and they don't respond to monitors. And what they said is mass training makes it so that the whole crowd is the one that enforces the discipline. And they had a joke. They said, you know, if somebody breaks nonviolent discipline, a lot of times they want to they want to go to the cops instead of to the movement because the consequences being thrown in jail uh, from the cops is is better than the consequences from the movement because the whole movement is going to be is going to be frustrated and angry uh, if you break nonviolent discipline because they know it affects them. So everybody enforces it, and when somebody throws a rock, they they're seeing whether or not the crowd supports it, and you have to train people not just to be bystanders, but to be collectively responsible for holding the essential DNA and defending against against the biggest diseases. Thank you. And the other two parts, I think, thank you both for, for talking about mass training. Then the part three and four is about really action agreements. So are we a clear, for example, agreeing on nonviolent discipline before an action happens, right? And then do we have a proactive outreach, meaning that when we engage new people into an action, are we very clear with them about the principles or the traditions of how we're going to run this action, right? And of course, the last point of defense is monitors and the core leadership, meaning two things. One, when your action is happening and there is something that should not be happening, do we have enough people or trained monitors that can address the situation at that moment to prevent something from going crazy? And two, also sometimes the core leadership has to do a lot of defending meaning that sometimes another organization maybe opens up because it's decentralized. They have the branding of the movement, the story of the movement, but they're doing actions that are not with the theory of change or are not clear with the principles. Then the core leadership sometimes has to go there, talk to them, and figure out how to get back on track. So those are, again, think the four lines of defense. So I would say the monitors and core leadership, this is different than what a lot of people do, which is they just have monitors. They don't do the traditions and principles. They don't do the mass training. And so what happens is the monitors enforce it, and they don't have support from the crowd. And they and, keep it up. And, they, and, and the people who are throwing rocks or punching cops or breaking windows, they don't care about the monitors. They're like, screw you, Dad. I hate you. You know, they don't want to deal with the monitors. You're a peace cop. You know, so what we see in a decentralized model is monitors and core leadership is really just reminding the crowd getting they're like white blood cells that teach every cell and help uh, label what is outside the DNA or the traditions and principles so that all the cells can collectively do that and not remain bystanders or, or spectators which is naturally how people orient unless there's somebody that's calling them out to courageously engage that's what monitor's job is. It's not just to engage the person, but it's to get everybody engaged in. And there's a tradition in India that Gandhi developed called Shante Sina, which was another way of thinking about this, is that the monitors would, would do a chant that really called everyone forth to, cool. to support uh, the nonviolent discipline. But it was the same concept that really uh, their individuals are the ones that, that are, there's like a code word to get everyone to enforce it. And the core leadership, this is about nonviolence, but it's also about all the different things we're talking about in the DNA. 
Um, and the core leadership might have to do that go to the teams and find them. And each one of these levels of defense are all mutually reinforcing. All interconnected. You can't do one, you know, a lot of times without the other, or if you do, it doesn't really work. Each one builds on the other, and each of them are important for their own reasons. And Paul, just before you go over traditions, I want to make a big point about traditions. And as you notice, the number one point of defense is tradition and principles, right? So. Think about if you're going to do mass training, but you don't have the tradition and the principles, even if you do action agreements and monitor, you're going to struggle a lot. So I think what we're really trying to do is really get into understanding what are all the problems that we have or that we anticipate to have, and then what are the principles that could prevent that. We think that's very important, and that's what we're going to talk next. Okay, so what are our traditions and principles, right? Well, we know that we need to give every leader all the DNA they need to survive. But a lot of times the norms in culture that we have with each other are, are implicit. They're not explicit. And it takes a long time to figure out all those norms, to figure out all the processes. Well, in a decentralized organization, we have to systematize it. We got to make it very clear and we have to be, it has to be in a, such an accessible form so that it can spread to groups very quickly and that anybody who joins understands it instantly, okay? And the 12-step tradition is really a prefigurative theory of change. They're, they really don't want to engage politics. They just want to create a mutual aid to help alcoholics. And it's an amazing organization. It's, it's been around for over 50 years and it has over a million members. It has thousands and thousands of groups all across the country that are very sustainable. If you calculate all the hours of therapy that is given from alcoholic to alcoholic, it's, it's, it's almost as much as all the therapists combined in the United States of America, and it's done for free. And it's kind of a decentralized, so Bill W. even acknowledged kind of an anarchist model of providing mutual aid. One thing that Bill W. did that was a genius uh, move for an organizer is after he created the steps, he systematized how people can go through recovery, but then he realized after the organization spread across the country, there was hundreds and hundreds of groups, he realized that the organization was very fragile, that groups were, were falling apart all the time, and he, there was really only like two or three staff in the, in the national office, and they would get calls all the time from groups that were falling apart because of internal conflict. And he made a meticulous record of every problem that was given to him and different problems. And he categorized these problems into 12 different categories. And he created the basic protocols that were the most effective. He analyzed which ones allowed for sustainable, um, basically sustainability uh, in the midst of that conflict, in the midst of those problems, and he developed what we call the twelve, what he calls the twelve traditions. And if you if you read these, they're amazingly they're complex. Um, and in 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 the twelve step tradition, they read these in almost every single meeting. The elders know the traditions very well, and these traditions are basically the the DNA that protects them against the most common problems for the groups to fall apart. And they have a book called uh, the 12 and 12 that has a long historical form of the history of how they developed those. What we advocate is that we need the same thing. The movement needs the same thing. And we're not the only one. Burning Man, uh, you, you look at uh, the Pirate Party, you look at a lot of different decentralized organizations has a form of traditions. We call them principles, but they have the same principles thing, yeah. that make the DNA accessible and make the, the, the problems um, that are common, uh, the responses to them accessible to everyone. So uh, we're, we believe that we need to do that too, and we have devised one, not just me, but uh, 99 Rise, which is an organization some of people on the phone call has been part of. They analyzed a lot of decentralized organizations and found 10 principles that are very common um, and some of them you can see in the Pirate Party or, or Bernie Man or even Movement for a New Society had some of these. Uh, and there are 10 basic principles that uh, give people everything they need uh, so that they, they don't collapse from the common problems.
And then, Paul, you're going to go through them. I know through the yes. active popular support escalation and absorption. But I want to talk for a second around mass training. And I know we talked a lot about mass training in the last session in the context to get more engaged, uh, to understand your DNA, your theory of change. We have done quite a lot of training around that. But I want to talk to you about how do you train or how do you do mass training to uphold some of the uh, principles and traditions. So, for example, Paul mentioned, uh, could you, would you like to hide the organ? Yeah, the super is there. Yeah, so Paul mentioned how we can, uh, for example, talk about nonviolent discipline, right? And, and he was given the example of the vaccination. So, what happens is that sometimes you need to have a little bit of the disease to be able to deal with it. Correct. So what we do sometimes in mass training, let's say that we sometimes create in a scenario of like, okay, there's 50 of us here. Let's create in a scenario. What would happen if there is violence in a protest? And we're going to role play the whole thing right here, right? And then people are going to get triggered. It's going to be hard. But then that gives people the tools and the understanding of how to do it. Plus also it creates reinforcement around the issue. So you can even integrate all your principles. You can say, okay, meta narrative. We're going to do an exercise about meta narrative. And you say, you do the meta narrative, and you get some people to say, now you're going to say something completely different. And then you try to get the whole group to enforce the principle that this is our narrative, or this is our common purpose, or this is our theory of change. So that's the part of how we put the principles within mass training. That's why to us, mass training is really important because, at least with nonviolent discipline, if people are not trained on how to deal with it in the moment before, Imagine when things are getting cut. Imagine what things have happened. I just want to say this about mass training is that in the United States, I think there is a tradition of preparing people around actions that are maybe like two hour or three hour trainings, like preparing people around a few principles, like maybe nonviolence or action agreements or action scenarios, maybe even giving them a sense of what the meta narrative is. Like in Occupy, mm -hmm. they had a great uh, way to basically initiate people into the whole frame of Occupy. But what we learned is that if you're going to do decentralized organizational structures that we've seen really work, um, especially from our experience from the Serbian revolutionaries, you need to do a much more complex mass training. We're talking five days or, or a full two days on a weekend that goes through all the front loading in the DNA because that's how long it takes to, to do the, the stuff that Carlos is talking about. Yeah. And we know that's not even including a lot of basic organizing skills. That's just including what we call the initiation training for the DNA. It's just creating the explicit norms for the revolution so that that group can go out there and not uh, uh, lose control in a way that screws everybody else. That gives them total autonomy after they do the initiation training, and you don't have to worry. You can trust them. That's right. That amount of training is something that we have not seen in the United States of America, which is front-loading in a in a way that I'll, that gives a very complex uh, DNA and because you have to get the DNA, the traditions, and then the skills. And there is a way to put them all together because when you do team formation or you do teams training on teams, you can talk about the tradition or the principle of inclusion, right? You can think about some problems. You can give them the DNA of what kind of teams you want to do. But it requires a certain uh, science and art to kind of figure out how to do that kind of training. But it's totally doable. It's totally doable. So, Paul, let's continue because it's 8, 11. So I'm just going to say, so when we developed uh, a sample uh, of, of traditions or principles that we came up with with 99 Rise and we took from other organizations too. Um, we grouped them in the categories of active popular support, problems with escalation, and problems with absorption. And these principles like common purpose of the meta narrative is having the same meta narrative and having it very clearly explicit to everybody when they when they join. Um, Strategic unity, which means that everybody has the common theory of change. Um, and a strategy is helpful, having a grand strategy, a common one. That's not a detailed strategy. That's a broad strategy. It allows lots of autonomy and people to develop their own tactics, their own campaign, but at least they have strategic unity. If they join this movement, they're going to they're gonna agree to this basic strategy that allows unity. Six is inclusion. Uh, this allows people not to have those 
cult problems of having just a culture that uh, includes a, a small group of people that you know, might be racist or sexist or not know how to relate to other people, uh, or even groups that are very isolating towards uh, people who are new to politics, who don't have all the, the lefty jargon or whatever. So we need, we need a culture that allows us to be empathetic and allows us to affirm uh, marginalized people, but also people who, um, who need to be part of our movement but might not know uh, how to relate. And so we need a, a policy to include everybody and instead of the, creating a cult-like culture. And we need pluralism, uh, which is we need to have a principle that allows very explicitly that we want people, even if they don't have the same uh, organizational processes or structures, even if we disagree with what they do in a lot of other forms of politics, we have to understand how to build a pluralistic movement with churches, with unions, with a lot of different people. And that, that means that we can't, um, we can't have like an understanding of a counterculture that doesn't include um, unions that might, might be hierarchical or might have a totally different process. We have to have uh, an understanding that we need, we need um, many different people, many different institutions in our movement. What to the escalation? I mean, in the escalation piece, we have, for example, the principle here, nonviolent discipline, which I hope at this point I don't have to talk too much about, right? Third one, a strategic unity, which Paul was talking about the common theory of change. I think it's just a repetition of what we had in the first one. And then <coughs> the last one is democratic cooperation. And this one really has to do with how do people participate. So for example, and the specific thing about voting with your feet. So if a majority of people want to take collective responsibility or personal responsibility to be part of the movement, to do more, to escalate, they can do that. Because you're saying that only people can vote if they are committed to do it, you know? Absorption. So absorption, um, uh, the three principles that we find very helpful for absorption is that um, we want to have a philosophy that we're all leaders, not not the exact opposite, that there are no leaders, because then we're leaders for yeah. Leader full because it doesn't allow people to take responsibility and be validated in those roles. Um, and even though we're not a hierarchical organization, we want everyone to be a leader. There's no competition for leadership. There's no like titles. But we need to be able to have a team structure and an understanding of leadership that allows everyone to grow and take more responsibility and be supported and sustained because it's vulnerable to be a leader in the movement. And especially a movement like ours that is based on volunteerism. And this is a really big conflict. It's a huge one. Because almost all of these nonviolent movements are created through volunteers. And it can't expand unless the base of the movement is volunteers. Doesn't mean that you don't have paid staff, or it doesn't mean that you don't have um, people that work but uh, uh, have full time jobs but part time support the movement or, or have money and. And, and give that or donate their time, but uh, what it does mean is that the movement is oriented to supporting volunteers, that volunteers are driving this, the movement is driven by volunteers, and that pe the, the ethic of when people join, they're being supported in, in, in a culture of voluntary simplicity, that no one's really making much money off of this. And that's it, very important. You can see this in the United Farm Workers, you can see this in Gandhi, yeah. you can see this in almost every, the Akpur student movement, they're all, the whole culture was of volunteerism. You see this in Occupy, so it was a culture of volunteerism, and that really allows you to expand and really create a movement. Professionalism and having staff positions is really, um, you can have that, but there has to be an understanding. It has to be limited. It has to be limited, and limit. those positions are really supporting the volunteers, and when, when volunteers can take those positions, they should. People should organize themselves out of a job, and that's very hard for people to do who have a, a professional position. Well, can I talk about open source for a second? So, um, so there was a moment in the Dream Movement when we were having so many teams come in, and I remember people asked me, well, Carlos, what does that require for us to be an affiliate of United We Dream? And we said, well, what it means is that you have a group of five people that have a following of 100 people, and then you have six months within the organization, and then you can formally join. And in so many ways, what we were doing is creating a principle of that if you have these requirements, you can join in. I wish we would have been a little more open source about it, 
but actually we were we were in practice because people will be like six people will come together and we're like you're a team we don't care if you have ten hundred people following you know join in you build it as you go and come in but I think it's so important for the movement to have principle about being open source and for example Rick Falkovich from the private you know the private political party says that if you have three people if three people come together and they decide to form an organization kind of a chapter of the pirate political party that they're automatically a recognized organization by the whole institution and they get the branding they get the support they get the training they get the whole thing from every other group and I thought that principle is so cool because you have to imagine this in absorption is that you won't have time to do one-on-ones with people to get them to do stuff they have to make decisions on their own and most of the times it's can I join and they go to your website and they don't know if they can join or they say well what if if it's just three, then we need to have more. No, no, no. It's just three. With three, you can go. And the, or if I'm just a person, it's so much easier just to get two buddies together than to get ten or twenty. So I think those the principles. I'm just super excited about the principles. So I'm just gonna say that. So team is eight, eighteen. We're doing so good in time, and we're pretty much done with this one. And we'll do a little goodbye at the end. Don't worry. Uh, but we want to do a little discussion time, just about what are some of your reflections. Also, what is what has been helpful or what was helpful from our presentation? And what is somewhat unclear what questions do you have? So it looks like um Estefania, did you raise your hand? Or were you just messing with the webinar platform? Do you have a question? <laughs> I just unmuted you so you can speak. Okay. It's just my mom is talking in the background just in case. So that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> um yeah, no, I thought that the absorption was really helpful. Um here, I mean, we're part of the Pico affiliate, but as part of CBC, we're really small, and we had an action with like 2,000 people, and that exact same thing happened where we don't know what to, we didn't know what to do with them, and it's like some people come, and it's like, well, you could just start doing one on ones, and so the absorption piece is really, really helpful. I thought. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Stephanie. Cornerstone is mass training. Mass I can't training. emphasize that enough. You gotta have, and you gotta have the capacity to do the mass trainings when you have the people and a lot of, a lot of times we don't think like that because we have a thousand people we're like do we have do we have 20 trainers that could do 20 different trainings for a thousand people oh, can I add to this yeah. I was recently talking to the Swedish Red Cross and they were sharing to me their process of mass training because they're highly volunteer and they were saying to me that actually they have some sort of a rule that the staff doesn't really provide the mass training is the volunteers so they have long-term volunteers that are only committed to do mass training and when you have 30 to 40 people interested, you just call them and they say, hey, can you do the weekend? And they say, yes. And they already have the curriculum, the training. They've done it plenty of times. So imagine if your organization will already have a little army of trainers that you just call them and they come up and set up the training, you know, and this is part of the volunteer culture. So that kind of gets at a question that Ty, that Ty submitted, which was that how do you balance new people who can't come to a training but can come to meetings, actions, and volunteer? How do you enforce this principle of requiring mass training as an initiation? And I just want to say in the context of mass training that it's so cool when you have the different levels and people get the little badge that I'm now a trainer, like they get a big T button or something that said I'm a trainer. And people love this stuff. You can give them the diplomas and all this stuff. And they want to do and they want to be called trainers, you know? So I think sometimes, I actually think that we always have a deficit of leadership because we don't create enough leadership posts meaning enough leadership positions for volunteers to join in. Mm -hmm. it, it, a lot of times when you're starting a movement, it doesn't make sense to really invest a lot of resources in training all the trainers, unless you expect that you're going to get momentum. Through escalation. Through escalation. So the unions, structure-based organizations, they don't, they don't predict escalation and momentum. We have to predict it. We have to say, if we're going to do this action, we're planning on creating a trigger event or a moment of the whirlwind. So we have to set it up beforehand. Once once it, it, it pops off, it's too late. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. No? Um, so those are all the questions that we have for now. Um, but I definitely want to encourage more people to submit things. You know, what was helpful, what was unclear, what what jumped out at you. Um, this is also our last webinar, so if you have like no. any, you know, final words that you want to share with the presenters or um, other people here, that's also welcome. And um, I also want you all to know that we will be sending out a feedback survey. 
um, on these webinars. It's very short. It's only um, four or five questions long. So if you could respond to that, that would be great because, um, as you know, this was our first webinar that we've ever done. Um, and we expect and anticipate and look forward to your constructive feedback so we can make these better. And if there's nothing that we can improve, I, I don't believe you because <laughs> this is our first one.